he saw how when anything tech showed up, like I would want to take it apart. Uh, so he he was, you know, he also saw how I just loved stories, and he was like, "I'm gonna talk to my kid brother about what it takes to make movies." That was San Francisco born and raised filmmaker H. P. Mendoza. I'm Jeff, and this is Storied San Francisco. This podcast is a little different for us. For one, it's much longer, but that's just how it goes. But also, it's our first of what should be a few visits with past guests. HP was on the show in season one, but back then, we just wanted to hear stories, not people's personal histories. And so we went back and recorded again with one of our favorite humans. Again, this episode is longer than normal, and there's still going to be a part two. Check back Thursday for that. Here's HP telling us the story of his life. Oh, wow. Wow. Where do I begin? I feel like there are so many books and screenplays where someone has given the task of having to talk about their life story, and they always start with, where do, they, where do I begin? And then the interviewer says, start at the beginning. <laughs> um, and that organically happened. So, yeah. Um, yeah, but I'm, I'm saying start if you want to start before the beginning. Before the beginning. So, 65 million years ago. No, I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I was I was born here, in the mission, in the bar, in 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 casements. Right? Yes. No, this is, we're not too far from where I was born. Actually, I was born at St. Luke's Hospital, which uh, became CPMC, and is now just. Air. I don't know what's there. It got torn it down is, recently. It's some kind of new, I believe, hospital. Oh, it but is a hospital. it's next to where St. Luke's was. Oh, good. Okay, because everything in this city has been turned into a crunch gym, so that's not the case. Correct. Okay. <laughs> they might have a crunch gym inside. Right. I can't be sure. <laughs> Sorry to you fitness folks out there. I'm not anti-fitness. I'm just anti-you. Um, <laughs> I was born there in the Mission, and I grew up out in the Excelsior. Okay. Um, can, you, can, can you say you cross streets? I can. 624 La Grande. Okay. Yeah, right at the edge of Crocker Amazon Park, like right at the edge, like where all the eucalyptus trees were. And if I knew then what I know now, I would have called myself affluent then. Oh, okay. But we weren't. Right. <laughs> you know, like I, I, we were just a poor, fil- not poor, but you know, we were middle class. Working class. Working class uh, Filipino family okay. living out in the Excelsior District. And I just found out that some coworkers, old, old coworkers of mine just bought a house out there for like over like $1.4 million. Right. And I'm like, and their house now is half the size of the house I grew up in. Right. How's that? I mean, it is still San Francisco. Yeah. There's that. It's right. It's in the seven by seven, so of course it's ridiculously expensive. But yeah. But your point was also because a function of time. Um, I, I, you don't have to say your age, but I'm guessing you were born a, more than a few years ago, and life was just different. Life was different, and life was different. But you know, my father's mother actually was very smart. Um, and very savvy, had uh, uh, ha- had numerous houses in San Francisco. Okay. Francisco. Um, uh, this is, this was before I was born. When I was born, okay. all we had access to was the house I grew up in. But my father's mother uh, was actually an English teacher in Kansas, oh, wow. and so she was you know she was very much um, indoctrinated. Uh, indoctrinated is too strong of a word. Um, she was she was Americanized. You know she you know she Kansas will do that. To you people. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Wichita actually. Sorry. Okay. Which is Kansas, sorry. Yeah. Um, Did she, was she born there? or No, she was born in Alcala, Pangasinan, in the Philippines. Okay, so uh, she immigrated on her own as an adult or with her parents? Do you know? know? I don't know. That's okay. Yeah. The fact, the point of her not being um, born there and immigrating is, I think, important. Yeah, you know, it's so funny. I never really thought to look for the, the answer to any of those questions because we never really asked. Because you can see we weren't that connected to her. This podcast you know? is asking that question. So. Yeah. <laughs> no, but anyway, so one of the houses that, they, that she had was right next to Moby Dick's. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Imagine if we hung on to that. Wow. Yeah. Was Moby Dick's there when um, she yeah. owned it? I think. Oh, wait, maybe it wasn't, actually. But if it, And, and um, that neighborhood was, what was it called? Like... Uh, Eureka Heights or something? Eureka Valley. Eureka Valley, yes. Yeah, 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 Eureka Valley. Before the gays came. Before the gays came. That's back when, yeah, that's back when gay meant happy. Right. Yeah, now gay means extremely happy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but 
they owned that house. They had a house uh, at 154 Edinburgh Street in the Excelsior, also near Silver. Okay. Um, and yeah, the house I grew up in was 624 La Grande, and the cross street was, oh God, what was what's that big avenue? Monterey? The uh, one that leads uh, up to the big blue tower, the La, Gra- the La Grande Tower. Um, that was our that was our Salesforce tower back then. Oh God! You know? <laughs> um, Meaning you could see it in your nightmares and you it, close your eyes. Oh, I mean, cause, <laughs> right? Like I feel like like um, the most common phrase in San Francisco for me growing up was like, "Is someone smoking weed?" Like that's what you would hear anywhere in San Francisco. But now the phrase you hear from any point in San Francisco is, "Oh, look, the Salesforce tower." Yeah. You know, it's, it's the most visible thing from any point in San it's, Francisco. It's Sauron's eye. It's Sauron's Which eye. Which they did once, and I was gonna give them credit. I was like, "That's cool." And it was just one night of however many nights they've been around. Yeah, I, I I'd like to think that they're probably going to step up, the, you know, step up their game a little bit. They've got that mad like a giant LCD up there at the top of the tallest fucking thing that everyone can see. I know. Make you know, have fun with it. Yeah, have fun and maybe actually maybe get some artists to do some stuff that Thank might you. actually uh, make use of its own limitations, right? Because it's not right. like let's let, let's be honest, it's not a big Tokyo sign. It's not like right. it's crystal clear in 4K. Right. It has its own limitations. So maybe don't put like dancing figures. Maybe maybe something that might be, I don't know, a little more abstract. Mm-hmm. Like we we can handle that in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. We can handle Speaking art. Of... So, but uh, going back to. Um, uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the Excelsior. Mm. You had your own uh, Salesforce tower. <laughs> yeah, it was a, right, right. That was the La Grande Tower, the blue tower at the end of La Grande. Do um, you know what it, like, what, um, do you know, first of all, what brought your grandmother here? Again, I don't know her okay. story too much. Uh, she was a pretty opaque person. Okay. Uh, but I, I do know that my mother's side, you know, uh, my mother and father came here in 1968. Oh, they came together already. They Yeah, had already they met. came okay. with my two brothers. Um, okay. And they did the Filipino thing where they came in, they came together and they petitioned everybody over. One by one. Okay. My mother had 11 brothers and sisters. Whoa. I mean, has. I don't know why I say had. She has 11 brothers and sisters. And wow. They're, for the most part, they're all here except for like two, I think, who okay. are still in the Philippines. Does that mean you have like 100 cousins? I have, oh my God. I mean, they all have like three or four kids. Right. You know, so I have a very, 40, very... 40, 50 or something like that. Yeah, the family parties, I, I can show you pictures. Like, it's. Yeah. I tried to recreate that with my film Bitter Melon, mm. you know, but it's, you know what the really funny thing is, is when you write that, you when you try to write your experience of your family life into a script... You know, and you're doing like the Filipinos will get this. I think I, I I said that so many times as I wrote it. I'm like Filipinos will get this. They'll get they'll get this. This is just what happens. It's yeah. not about Christmas. It's about parties. Parties always have 40 or 50 people, and then you have like your three white producers saying like, this feels a bit extra. Why don't you you know Christmas parties aren't like this. Like this should be like three or four people max. I'm like clearly they've never been to a Filipino party. They had not. Oh, yeah, man. and so it's really funny to this day whenever I see like Filipino media and there's like a party. And they don't even say what the special occasion is. It no. might just might like be like you know movie night. Yeah, and someone someone might be wearing a tux, and someone else, some other dude might be wearing flip flops and shorts. Well, because it's movie night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But like, I would just like send them like the links. I'm like, see. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I grew up a very, with a with a very big family, yeah, okay. which is even bigger now. Um, and it's so big that like you know it's we we all communicate through like Instagram. I don't know why that's become kind of like the okay. social media of choice. You know. Okay. That's fine. No judgment. No, no judgment. No, I. I, I you Are know. you saying it's bigger because the generate? There's now a generation younger than you. No, we all gained weight. Or, no, <laughs> I, 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 no, yeah, it's it's it, because they all have you know they all have kids now and yeah, um and and we just don't die, right? Like everyone I grew up with is like still alive. My grandmother is 97 years oh, old. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah, the same one like, you've been talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh no, no, no. I'm sorry. Actually, no, no. Your my fa- my father's mom died. Your mom's mom is still. My father's mother died. My mother's mom, she's still alive in the Philippines. Okay. She just celebrated her 97th birthday. Wow! Happy birthday. Yeah, happy birthday, Lola. Um, going back, so you said your parents came here in 68. 68. Yeah. Do you know what brought them out here? Um, And where and where they came from? Also from Alcala, Pangasinan. The uh, Pangas, yeah, uh, Alcala was the name of the town. Okay. Um, and. Yeah, they came here because that's what you did. Okay. You know, my uh, it, it 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 didn't hurt that my grandfather, my mother's father, fought for the U.S. Army. Okay. Um, so he had, you know, he had ties already, and he, you know, he he had the stories, he had the narrative, 
you know, seeing as how the Philippines was part of the coalition of the willing back in World War II. Mm -hmm. um, if you were fighting for the U.S. during World War II, you were fed that narrative. Um, side note, I just saw an article that I haven't read yet, I think it's in the Atlantic, calling the, talking about how the, the Philippines turned out to be like most, the most useless ally to the United States, but that's a different story. I haven't read that yet. Fuck, <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, so my grandfather, of course, passed that on to all the kids, and like, this, you know, even to this day when I hear my uncles and aunts talk about it, they talk so much about how, you know, we, we fought so hard for you to come here because we knew about the opportunities. I'm like, well, yeah, I didn't come here, I was born here. Yeah. You know, my brothers came here. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, my two older brothers, they, um, they didn't retain the language, you know? I think my brother can emulate it and he can like say a few things, but he's, you know, he's American, you know, he yeah. came here when he was two. Okay, right, I was gonna ask, they were too young. Yeah, they were very small. You mentioned that your parents came f here from the Philippines, but your, gram your dad's mom was from Kansas. Yeah. Did your dad, was your dad born in Kansas? No, my dad was born in Alcala, Pangasinan. Okay, did she go back or? I don't know the whole That's story the part around. You it's, don't know. It's, it's, it's she was an enigma, and I, you yeah. know, I, I think people say that about anyone they don't know. But that's the truth. Like, it's <laughs> true enigma. Like, I, I, I'm not. Tr I'm not trying to like shirk responsibility. I, I, I no, we wanted to know her. She could be in two places at once. That's how much of an enigma she was. Maybe. Probably. Let's just go with that. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Well, kind of. Kind of yeah. I, I, I don't know if she was that talented, but <laughs> I know that she was really tough. Okay. I think you'd have to be. To be an English teacher, an English teaching Filipino national in Wichita, Kansas, Absolutely. in 1960, whatever. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. And that's not to say anything against Wichita. That's that, 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 I'm just talking about the immigrant experience. Right. You know, for the record, I love Wichita. Oh, okay. Um, you know, it's and it's it's. I, I've only heard good things about it from my grandmother, and even like now, as uh, as someone who's. Um, cheap plug for a moment uh, on the board of the Wichita Tallgrass Film Festival okay <laughs> love you guys <laughs> um, yeah I love Wichita and so, so much that actually um, one of the, the new movies that I'm writing for uh, for for a major streamer I can't say who it is uh, actually opens in Wichita okay uh, but back to what you want to talk about which is me and not sure. not my plugs um, yeah I, I'd like to think that um that one of the reasons why we didn't get along with my grandmother so much. Um, I can think of a, t a, a ton of nefarious reasons, all the stuff that we were fed by, you know, the family saying, like, well, you know, she's just evil, blah, blah, blah. That's the kind of stuff that you're fed when you're, you know, you're a kid, and you believe that stuff, you grow up with it. But when I think back on it, I'm like, but she was also a fucking badass. Yeah, and just a different. Just different, yeah. yeah. Complicated. And I know what that's all about. <clears throat> right. You know? Um, she did her own thing. Obviously, did you know her? Like, did you did you interact with her at all? In your I life, interacted young with life? her. Okay. She really liked me. Okay. Um, it's funny because she. Uh, okay, this is interesting. Um, I feel like I'm about to feed you a story based on based on broken memories and conjecture. Abs but that's what this podcast is all about. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> well, then I, I could talk for hours. Um, my grandmother, her name was Fei Li. Okay. Yeah. Like Fei, Fei Li. Fei Li. Fei Li Mendoza. One word or two? Uh, two words, Fei, Fei Li. Fei and Li. Okay. Yeah. Um, but, you know, in typical Filipino fashion, it got short to Feli. Okay. You know? Uh, so she was my grandmother, Feli. Or if you say it the way the uh, Ilocano say it, Lola Feli. Lola Feli. And um, she was someone to be feared. You know, she was, uh, she was feared not because she was gruff. Or, or even brusque, or even just like physically intimidating. She Did was she carry a stick or anything. No, like, that's okay. the thing. She, None it, of that. it, 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 it wasn't that. even like you know. She like the, there was the fear of physical harm. Um, she just had the look of judgment, and and I remember we grew up with pictures of her on the wall, um, and the pictures. And I don't know if this is just because that's the way pictures were taken back then, and I was too much of a modern of the modern era to look at these pictures with any perspective. But she just looked like Rita Hayworth to me. Okay. You know, like wow. she just looked like a Hollywood star. Okay. Um, and as she got older, she didn't really lose that face. Okay. You know, um, she just had a look of class. And my mother and my family always liked to pride themselves on being working class and, in their words, peasants, farmers, you know, okay. people who came from the country. Right. 
Um, so I think there was a whole lot of like star-crossed class contract uh, conflict between my mother and father. Between the family. Oh sides. yeah, within the family. Oh, oh, even, okay. You know now. Okay. But um, um, wow, I stayed sober and not high for this podcast, and I still have trouble talking. That's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I feel like um, my grandmother represented something to my family that was unknowable. Hmm. If I were to put my thinking cap on now, my adult hat, uh, I actually think that maybe my grandmother kind of kept a lot of that stuff in my family, not because she was secretive, but she just... Oh, God, how do I say... I can't even say it sensitively, but... Um, you know how... You're a podcaster, Jeff. I you think know? so. You're, 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 you're essentially... You're, you're, you're in the arts. Sure, yes. Um... If you had the choice to describe what you do to my uncle who works security at the airport and just not talking to him, right? You know, like, you'd probably choose the path of least resistance, right? Yeah, yeah sure, sure. Um, so I think my grandmother wasn't doing it out of snobbery. In hindsight, I see this now. It's, it's suddenly clear uh, now that I'm 44. Um, she just had to do her own thing and kind of protect herself because for the most part, if she did explain what she did, if she did explain why she lived the way she did, she'd be called a snob, you know? It, oh, you yeah. teach English. Ooh, you're, you're better than us. And I, I and I did hear a lot of that growing up. Like, oh, yeah, she taught English. No, they, they would praise her to my face because I was born here and they always said I spoke so well. I was mm. so eloquent, mm -hmm. which I'm not. I just speak English, right? right. And they, they, they would say like, oh, well, you know, you're, you're Lola Feli. She taught English, you know? You're, 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 uh, you, you come from a lineage of smart English speakers. Carrying on the tradition. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, but yeah. if they ever fought, felt like saying anything ill, uh, bad about her, they would just say like, well, yeah, she is an English teacher after all. <laughs> you know, I don't know why I made her something she was from Jersey. <laughs> after all. Anything east of here is true. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, it, it also, is this correct? It sounds like she was more of a doer. But she just did her life. She taught. She The reason houses. I think she was a doer, I think you're right. And the reason I think she's a doer is I never heard about my grandfather. I was just going to ask, where's, where's grandpa? She never talked about him. Right. We went there, and all I knew about her was she had an amazing house. Um... Amazing in the way that I mean, like truly amazing. Notice, amazing isn't really a qualitative word. <laughs> like she just had like this aesthetic that I just didn't even, you know. We yeah, didn't. was it nice? Yeah, it was yeah. nice. It was, yeah, it was and amazing. Yeah, it was full of plants, which is amazing, right? I mean, that should say something, right? Like yes. she took care of a jungle in her, in her Edinburgh house. Like I, I can't explain real um, plants. Yeah, like like everywhere. That you like I, actually, take I, care I have a photo of it somewhere in my apartment. Mm -hmm. But on top of that, she had this piano, and um, um, I'm only. Uh, I used to tell people she used that I used to tell people that she forced lessons on my two older brothers. But at this point, I'm going to say she allegedly forced these lessons on my okay. brothers. Um, let's just say they took piano from her, okay. and they hated it okay. so much that they fought my mom, and my mom gave up. She was like, "Fine, don't take piano." So here I am. I'm born, and. Are you the third? I'm the third. I'm the third. I, I'm the youngest of three You're boys. You're the last of, of your parents' kids and the first one born in SF. The first one born in, in the, States. the United States. Yeah. Okay. So I'd go over there and um, I had no idea that I was beloved. I didn't know. Um, I just thought that's how they treated everybody in the family, you know? But of course, that's what you do, I guess, with the youngest. You know, oh, so you're the youngest too? Yep. So you understand? Yes. Yeah, I, I didn't know. Well. It's like, like, so of course, like, when, every time I watch like a Harry Potter movie, like, I, I get it. When you watch any Harry, especially an early Harry Potter movie, and some new, some new, adult character walks in, they have to look annoyed until they turn around and say, oh, "Harry Potter." That's that's me, right? And because I was the American-born youngest, yeah. right? And my grandmother was no exception. Like, I would walk in, and she would look really kind of, like, aggro. Like, oh, who's in my house? Ah, <gasps> it's you. And, you know, she would... Did she have a little name for you? Um, no. Okay. She didn't really have little names for people, mostly because she was a teacher. Oh, right. You know? So right. she was very much about, like, no, you will you will go by your God-given name. Okay. Um, but uh, I tinkered with her, with her piano. Okay. And I remember her saying, you know... If you want to learn something, you should watch someone play. I said, are you going to play for me? She's like, no. You want to see something? And underneath the piano, she would like um, rotate this tape player out, and she would pop in a cassette. And then she would pop it in, push the tape player back in, hit play, 
and the keys started moving on their own. Oh, like a player. And he was a player piano. I had never seen a player piano Way. besides what you know, besides the player pianos that you see like in my dad's westerns, where right. they have like the sheet music with like the holes. This was not that. This is like a cassette. And without gunfire. At the no saloon. gunfire. No yes, horse. This is just grandma's no spittoons. No, my mom, actually, my grandmother had a spittoon. <laughs> but. Spittoon. <laughs> There, there, there was this magic that was happening before me. Like I'm going to learn how to play piano. So I didn't, you know, I'm four. I don't know how this technology works, but I'm fascinated by it. So of course I run home and I grab like this Duran Duran tape and I come back with it. It doesn't work that way. Uh, <laughs> I was thinking I could play Hungry Like the Wolf on just popping any old cassette in there. But these were special tapes. They didn't. Yeah, the. the no, it, it was and that's a it, bummer. That would have been fun. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, I'll never forget. I did. I, I, I said that for a humorous impact. It wasn't Duran Duran. <laughs> yeah. uh, it was probably something else. But I remember just like it, it did move the keys, mm. but it just made them like shake. Like, I don't know what to do. What the fuck is this song? But, uh, but what happened was um, it got me into piano. You saw the keys and what they were doing and what it sounded like, and you're like, I want to do that, or yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and it 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 um, it gave me this concept of chords and melodies, right? You know, and my mother was like, mm-hmm, yeah, you know what? I've heard it all before. You're gonna give up just like your brothers did. Okay. You know what? No, you're not taking piano. And I said, well, can I come over here? She's like, of course. <laughs> of course, my mom's like, yes, he wants to be babysat. Yes. You know. <laughs> so um, so I would go there and I would play, and I remember. My playing was just tinkering. Like, you know how like kids are like when you're trying to play piano and a kid comes like, can I see? Blam 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 blam. You know. Yeah. That was me. Okay. Um, until I hit the first grade, and um, the Legend of Zelda had just come out, and I remember playing it so much at my cousin's house, and I was like, big fucking deal. That it was a game. big deal. Big and deal. interestingly, I actually didn't care too much about getting too far. I just wanted to play it. Mm. Because the song never changed. Right. It was always the <laughs> same song the throughout song the end. Keep going. And I was like, there are only two parts to this song. Well, I only have two hands. I bet you I could figure this out on her piano. Oh, really? And yeah, it was video games, my love for video games, that got me into piano and music. Thank you, Lola Feli, for, uh, for indulging me. <laughs> So you went to school here, though. You mentioned I first went grade. To here, yeah. um, where where did you go to school? Well, I'm going to back up one step. Mm-hmm. I went to um, I went to kindergarten at Cleveland Elementary School. Um, Is that out of the Excelsior? It's in the Excelsior. Sorry. Okay. Um, it's like in the heart of the Excelsior. Okay. God. Just a side note. I didn't realize how beautiful a lot of the stuff was I had around me growing up until I had like my out of town friends who come from like the desert. Or Maine, like here, <laughs> and like talking about how beautiful all this stuff is. I'm like, hey, you know what? Yeah. You're right. I, I I went. I grew up on a tree-lined street. Right. Crazy. And and the whole time we thought we were poor. Mm-hmm. You know, and we mm-hmm. always complained about how the rest of America lived. I go back to my old neighborhood and my old school now, and I'm like, it's gorgeous. Mm-hmm. Anyway, Cleveland. This is early '80s that you would have started was, school, like '81 or. It would have been '81. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I remember it was '81 because I. Um, this is something I wonder if I, I would. Lo- uh, for the for those of you listening at home, I want. I wonder if you could think about this. When was the first time you were aware what the years were, or when was the right. first time you were aware of what a year was, or when you were born? Because no, my, it was just age. You knew your age. You knew your that own was fucking age. Huge, but you're like, hey, well, who cares what year it is? In relation to years, you don't know yeah. what that means. And yeah. I'll never forget my kindergarten teacher at Cleveland Kindergarten. Right. She was like, "When were you born? When were you born? You." And she like pointed at this girl. She was like, uh, "I was born." And she said something. And she was like, "No, you weren't, stupid. No, that's not that's not possible. How about you?" And I was like, and I remember thinking like, "I've got this." <laughs> I was like, I was like, I was born. I figured that it must be the first year to ever have been invented because I'm right. the, I'm the, the, the only thing that time. exists, mm-hmm. right? So I'm gonna pick the first year that must have been invented. I said, 1981. And she was like. Stupid! It's 1981 now. Right now. No. Okay. How about you? <laughs> and I'll never forget that was the first feeling of humility I ever had. Oh, good. Because it really, Thank you. it really hit me. It, it hit me in a way that was just like, oh my god, I don't know everything. I'm wrong. I'm wrong. I'm told I know nothing. Which then tells me that I might have been spoiled. <laughs> like, how come I didn't learn what it was like to be wrong by my family? Right. You know. 83, uh, Return of the Jedi was the first Star Wars movie I saw. Okay. Because I saw it in the right, theater. Right, because you're like five, six. Yeah, and, yeah. And, but also because I was obsessed with whatever the hell this THX thing was. What's so special mm. about a THX theater? 
you know? Right, right. And, and why do I watch these makings of on TV? And George Lucas, always, there's always that section in the documentary where they talk about the sound, sound. you know? And um, what's funny is um, it, it was at that point that, like, you know, I was like, well, now I have to watch the first two movies. So it was like, <laughs> I was like, yeah, of course, Darth Vader's his father, you know? Um, but boy. Why is everyone surprised? Actually, at this moment, huh? What a fucking nerd I was. I was like, we have to go to watch it in 70 millimeter. No, that's funny, but I was just I was say, five. By contrast, in Fort Worth, Texas, where I grew up when Return of the Jedi came out, and possibly still to this day, there was no THX theater. It was just the thing in the beginning of the movie. It'd be like, boom, THX. We're like, but it's not a THX theater. Really? Yes. Are you absolutely. sure? Absolutely. We had an Omni at the museum, but that was it. We didn't have a THX theater. Mm. When, and when I was a kid, no. Maybe they do now. Hmm. Because I heard. So you have to understand. This is this must this must be everyone everyone's experience. I grew up thinking that I lived in like in like the lamest city in the world, you know. Right. And I just thought everywhere else was so amazing. And from what I heard, it's like Texas has everything, you know. Yeah. No. No. <laughs> Texas had some things. No, my family was just like, oh, Texas is big, and everything's big there. Their theaters are big, and my brother. That is all true. My brother Joe. My, he, so he was the reason I got into THX. He just, he he saw that I was really, it's funny because he's much older than me. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was born in 66, I was born in 77. Um, so, it's, you know, he was kind of the father figure, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, I would never want to tell him that because I think that would make him feel really old. Because <laughs> right. he likes being my older brother. But he had you when he, when he was 11. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like like some kids do, I guess. <laughs> But he got me into, he started, he saw how when anything tech showed up, like, I would want to take it apart. Okay. Uh, so he, he was, you know, he also saw how I just loved stories. And he was like, I'm going to talk to my kid brother about what it takes to make movies. And oh, wow. so he was like, he was like, look, he was going through the newspaper. He was like, you know what this means? This here, 70 millimeter. And he was like, I'll never forget him making this like the frame with his fingers he's like that's how big this is and this is how big a normal movie is so this, right. is, this is what the other one is I said so it'll be bigger he's like no well the screen stays the same size mm-hmm. and he explained to me how like clarity ratios works and, and ratio and, aspect mm-hmm. ratios and I was five and he was like and that's why I'm telling you about this because we're going to go watch Return of the Jedi basically he was priming me because he, he he had to babysit me and he really wanted to watch Return of the Jedi yes. <laughs> shut up and be amazed kids. So right I, and so nobody really... worked to this day I'm like well, you know what's really funny about this he got me into into film gauges, film aspect ratios, surround sound, 70 millimeter, six stripe audio. He got me into projection. He got me into computers, Tandy 1000s, TRS 80s, uh, Commodore 64s, Ultima, uh, Dungeons and Dragons, all that stuff. Robotech, Akira, all the geeky stuff that that is carved into my DNA now. And I bring it up with him these days, and he's like, "Oh yeah, I think I kind of know about that." <laughs> right. Like he, this was stuff that passed in through, like passed, like passed through his life, yeah. and he just passed on to me. And he has no idea how much he shaped me. Wow. And even to this day, he's like, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like when yeah, you Robotech. tell him, when you tell him how much he shaped you, he's like, cool. Or uh, I, I tell him, he, he goes oddly silent. Okay. Yeah, I don't think my brother doesn't know what to do with compliments. Adulation, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, because yeah. I just I just saw him recently. I, I oh, it was so great. I showed up and I, I went to Philadelphia uh, during the pandemic to just check up on him, you know, like and see how my family's doing. And he and his wife and his kids were great, but like still nobody was doing well. Right. Uh, and I showed up with like gifts, and it was really fun. And I I just felt like telling him, I'm like again, I don't know, for the umpteenth umpteenth time, I'm like, yeah, you know, um, I showed up with this Robotech box set for you. Um, I'm kind of embarrassed because I'm looking at your shelf and I'm, I realized I gave that to you last year. <laughs> but you have to understand it. It wasn't 4K then. Um, and uh, and he's like, yeah, no, it's cool. I keep all your gifts up there on the shelf. Yeah, no, it's cool. I put all this, I, I, it's, it's still there. I'm like, yeah, well, I mean, you know, it's funny that you keep it there on display because I feel like all the stuff you taught me Good is luck. constantly on display by the stuff that I make. Right. You know, like you really shaped a lot of who I am. Right. And he just sat there and stared at me. You could see the gears turning in his head. He's like, yeah. you know, does not compute. Like, you know, like, why is he valuing me? You right. know? Right. <laughs> um, well, officially, though, thank you, Joe, for doing all that. That's you hear that, a Joe? A lot. I mean, that's... You're you'll, t- about- you'll take this from a guy named Jeff, not me. <laughs> no, but the the piano, the Zelda, yeah, all this other stuff. Like, I'm seeing it in the HP that we know and love. But also, I, I think, Joe, 
Yeah, it's really funny because uh, you know, it's, so this, this is the funny thing. Before I even knew how genetics worked, I remember think to my, thinking to myself that uh, Joe is what a man should look like. Okay. You know, and I remember thinking to myself, archetype. Yeah, he's the archetype of, and I, I, I was always aware of the several archetypes that would be in my family, and he was the one that I was like, hey, if I, if I, if I end up looking like him, that's great. Do you, you know? look like him? No, I look at the pictures. I'm like, oh, I look like Joe. And right, so of course, made it. in my head, I'm like, that's fucking success, you know? Yeah. Um, and and it's just so funny because I I I, uh, I recognize now. I think because he's he's the oldest of three. Okay. He's not used to adulation. Right. You know exactly because exactly. he was used to pouring it on me. Mm-hmm. You know, so now that I'm like pouring it on him, he's just like, he's like, yeah. Um, yeah, you hungry? Like, I'll, I'll, I'll cook you something. Like, he, he just right. has to, he has to be useful in some way, you know. Um, but yeah, like he's he 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 shaped kind of like exactly like everything I do right now. If he's eleven years older, so so going back to like you starting school at Cleveland, um, was he like still at home? But he's like, he's getting up there. He's in high school. Yeah, yeah. So um, and your other brother probably possibly also in high school. Yeah, he's two so. years younger than Joe. Hector. Right. Yeah. Right. Um. Yeah, they're much older than I am, and they had their lives, right? You know, and they had lives away from each other because they had different uh, groups of friends. Do you feel like you've obviously mentioned Joe a lot and his impact on you? But like, do you feel like you know home life? Did you grow up with them around? I did. Okay. Yeah. I okay. mean, you know, they. Um, this is the funny thing. Like, whenever my bro- whenever Joe talks to my husband about like the good old days. He always has to, like, spend all this time talking about how absent he was. Okay. You know, he's like, well, you have to understand, you know, I, you know, we, you know, me and the family, we were, you know, we, we all did drugs and we were in gangs. And so I wasn't there for him. And I'm like, that's funny. My memory is that you were always there. Right. And, and, and I'm not disputing what you're talking about. Like, because he's my, my family is very open about, like, this, like, life of crime we had. Because, mm-hmm. you know, we had, like, you know, that weird immigrant experience where you kind of, you, know, you, you kind of look for belonging in whatever you can find, right? And if mm-hmm. you grew up in the mission, you're, you're going to find it in gangs, you mm-hmm. know? Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm glad that he's very open about it, but I um, I think that's his guilt talking. I was going to say, is he Catholic? Oh, uh, is he Catholic? We're Filipino. <laughs> yeah, we're Catholic. Just a guess. Uh, I'm still, I'm, I mean, like, you know, I may, be, I, I may be an atheist now, but I'm Catholic. Oh, totally. You know what I mean? Totally, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's like, I can't take that out of me. Yep. I will always have that guilt. But my brother still... He talks to he talks to my brother often. I, I, I sorry, he, my brother talks to my husband often, which I think is really nice. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he always talks about how absent he was. You no, know, if, if things could, if I could change things, you know, like oh, I would would have done this differently. I'm like, but you have to understand, like, I've come to a place. I've come to a place where I like I love myself now, and like, I attribute a lot of that to you. So get the fuck over it. Yeah, <laughs> you know. Okay, can we hear a little more about? Uh Home school play life in San Francisco in the oh, early start- to mid '80s. Oh, I told you about Cleveland. You started with Cleveland, yeah. Yeah. yeah well, I, the only reason I went there was because my two older brothers went there. Okay. But here's the thing: my family used to love to talk about how smart I was just because I spoke English. Okay. You know. Yes. Um, but they take pride in this. They take pride in this one very kind of pivotal moment, um, which is a very it was a very long protracted. Um, pivotal moment but it was one moment okay while i was in kindergarten in cleveland um we used to have to go to the schoolyard during recess and just kind of find ourselves and fuck off what we you know call basically like like, you know, like, like let, let the teachers drink in peace basically you right, know exactly and um <laughs> and you always walked into the classroom and was like why does it smell like rubbing alcohol right um but we would be in the schoolyard hanging out with each other and I think kindergarten was the first, was the last time in my academic life when I felt like I was with my tribe, <laughs> because okay. that's what you do, right? Right. But I was curious. So I was like, "Who are those kids over there?" Tribe curious. Yeah, I was. Yeah. I was. Yeah, <laughs> I was tri curious. Uh, I just wanted to see why there were kids standing in a grid. Who were those kids? Okay. And because um, I realized that like our group was just a bunch of kids who just hung out and like you know. A chalk, or right. like you know, See or how like far, who can spit the farthest? Right, yeah, that's what yeah. you did when you were a kindergartner. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, And I saw that there was another group of kids that, that stood in a grid, 
and that really fascinated me. I'm like, I'm going to stand in the grid too. <laughs> See what that's all about. So I, I, and I snuck over and I stood in the grid and I followed them and I walked into a classroom. And that wasn't yours. Yeah, and I, yeah. next thing you know, I was in the first grade, right? So I'm like, I'm sitting there, and I'm like listening to the teacher. And I'm like, oh, I don't know, I don't understand what the fuck you're talking about, because I'm a kid in kindergarten. It's 1981, and I remember, like, the, the teacher was like, "You there answering the questions wrong? Who are you?" <laughs> and um, I said, "I'm sorry, I got lost." And um, the cl- they all laughed. They yeah. thought it was they, they they thought it was really funny, and and I think, um, side note, that's also probably the last time, last time that a whole room laughed at me and I thought that I was a clown. Because I think <laughs> at any point after that, I thought I was a freak. But right. I got sent back to kindergarten. And, um, <laughs> down the hall. Down. Oh, no, no. It was a different it's building. A different school. If you guys pass by Cleveland, you'll see what it's like. Kindergarten's a bungalow. Right. And it looks really cute. Oh, and shit. And then the rest of the school was a separate building that looks like San Quentin. Wow. And and I just wanted to be in there. I just wanted to see what the, the big deal was. Like, what's that big prison-looking thing where people walk in grids? Um, and so that stuck with the teachers. They are like, why did he do that? Why did he do that? And they asked my mother, why did he do that? They asked my father, why do you think he did this? Um, because back then, everything you did was indicative of something. Right. You know? And my, my parents were under a lot of scrutiny. Um, and I never really understood why. I, I um, e- even to this day, I, I think was it race? Was it was it so, was it socioeconomic status? Was it you know what, what could it be? And I, to this day, I can't really pinpoint why. Mm. But they did, and they just like really watched what my parents did. Mm. So anyway, because they parents of three boys. Yeah, I mean, I wonder if it's because my my two older brothers were in gangs at this point. I don't know, yeah, but who knows? no, they couldn't have been. They would have been thirteen, fourteen. Too but young, yeah. No, they wouldn't have. No, you're right. They would have been teenagers. Anyway, uh, my mom then decided we need to make sure he's on the straight and narrow. So they pulled me out of Cleveland. They didn't want me to follow in my brother's footsteps. Let's try something new. Because yeah, I, I, can, I can, I get it. Like I could, you know, I could fault them, but fuck it. No, I probably would have done the same thing. Um, they sent me to Epiphany Catholic School. Okay. And that's where I was for a very long time. Like and all through high school. School. What's that? Through high school or? No, they no. It stopped at eighth grade. Okay, so just up to from high first to eighth grade. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, I went to first. I, I had to wear a uniform, yeah. and, and and I wore a uniform for many years. Yeah. You know that that like you know the maroon sweater over the white shirt and mm-hmm. the whatever, gray corduroy, which I hated at the time, and I would now love to own. <laughs> 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 but uh, yeah, I I I. I remember going into that classroom and going straight to the piano and playing Legend of Zelda. <laughs> yeah. And um, and I remember I was making friends and you know I I made friends I guess easily you know and um, what happened was I I didn't know that they were talking to the teachers over at Cleveland mm. and they told them about the incident. The the, um, the 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 wandering the first off grade. the the yes. the breaking out of the box by joining the grid into this. <laughs> yes. um, so I it I was blindsided out of nowhere. The third grade teacher came to me and said, "We think you're gifted. We okay. think that maybe you should skip the second grade. Would you be interested in just trying this, like just coming to the second grade while you're in the first grade?" And I remember. They- they were asking you. you. Me. Okay. I remember specifically because she was very tall and she had to like come down way low to talk to me. And um, and I remember saying like, oh, I don't know. And she was like, you have to understand, this is a great opportunity for you and you would save your parents a lot of money. She said that, Miss Barbero, bringing <laughs> finances into a Same. first grader's life. Anyway, she said, would you save your parents a lot of money? And... Uh, and of course, I'm like, okay, I'll do it. And I remember half of the day, every day from that point on, was spent in second grade. Nice. And um, and and I didn't. And I hated. So you didn't, it. you didn't skip second grade. You just did first and second together. 
or uh, some weird mix. At this or point, I think I only had a few months left before first grade was over, so I only did a few months of second grade. Okay. And um, and I, I did it because I thought it was novel, and I was like, this feels like when I snuck into that grid. <laughs> right, right. You're um, sneaking into third grade. And then the next year, third grade started. Okay. So I, I did skip second grade. I skipped so second you grade. Graduated a year earlier than other kids your age. I did, okay. and I think it's probably one of the most traumatic things I ever experienced because okay. I, I went to third grade. And my first grade, the, the friends I made in first grade wouldn't talk to me anymore. Right. They're like, oh, you think you're better than us. Mm-hmm. And then my third grade cohorts were like, you're a second grader. You're too young. You're supposed to be in second grade. Like, yeah. you're not one of us. Fuck. And I remember from that point on, I remember, I'll never forget, I, I remember the moment I lied. I was like, no, I didn't skip a grade. I'm your age. I've been with you the whole time. Remember, yeah, I'm like, remember I'm like, that year? I actually said, I said, I said, you just don't remember. Which is, oh my God, wow! Like I learned dishonesty early on, yeah. and and from that point on, I added one year to my age. Okay. And I stopped adding one year to my age, at the age of twenty six. Okay. Yeah. Like for your twenty seventh birthday, you're like, I'm twenty six. My surprise! Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And everyone's like, okay, cool. Fuck, that's fascinating. Yeah, because I just didn't want to be seen as the person who skipped the grade. Right. You know. Um, Did it work? Did your ruse work with the kids? I don't think it worked. <laughs> I don't think. I think they were just like, "Oh, there goes that kid that lies about his age." Right. You know, he's weird. Right. He's right. Dis- no, I'll never. I'll never forget walking like in the schoolyard and I'm passing by two girls and saying, "Like that kid is disturbed." Oh. You know, so man. I became that kid. You yeah. know, I became that kid that um, that I'm proud of now. Yeah. I am proud of that right, kid right. Um, because I, I think for the most part I was someone who. Who did no right? Who did no right from wrong? But when you're seven, you don't know how to right a wrong you've already done. Right. You know, so you double down, and you're and like, "No, I am. I am this old. I am eight. You know. And kids can kind of be shitty to well, each other. Well, yeah. Um, I mean, they're working stuff out. It's right. It's a way of. But I mean, in hindsight, now we can say that, right? Yes, absolutely. But in you know, for, for, from my eight-year-old mind, fuck all those guys. Right. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, like like Look at those old kids. Yeah, <laughs> I know. They, and and they were so old. they seemed old to me. Totally, they were one year older. Well, relatively, when you're seven and they're eight, that's like an eighth of your life. So I had to act old, right? And to me, acting old meant doing the things that they did. You know, okay. whatever that meant. Um, interestingly, interestingly, my predilections and interests were considered weird by them. But the thing is, now that I look back. I think they just thought I had old people interests. Like video games and movies? No, I think it was more like what books and what movies I did choose. Oh, uh, the specifics. Of yeah. Because I was really into rabbits. Genre. I was really into bunnies, you know? I, and they were like, oh, well, you should see me. I'm like, uh, yeah, um, sure. Or, or, or Watership Down. Watership Down. I'm just gonna say. And, I, and I remember telling a classmate, his name is Manesh Patel, I said, you should check out Watership Down. And a week later, he was like, we watched that. What's wrong with you? <laughs> he goes, first of all, that movie was like three hours long. It's not. It's 78 minutes. Um, but when, you are, when you're a kid having to watch an adult film about rabbits, you know, where like, the, the, and it's really, a, it's actually in all, you know, for all intents and purposes, it is a satire. Right. You know, satire doesn't have to mean comedy. It just means it has to be satirical. And it's about right. society. It's about civilization. It's about how, it's about how, it's about how societies work under duress. And it just so happens to have a not so subtle character named Napoleon. Mm-hmm. And it's a very bloody movie. Yeah. Um, but yeah, those were the, that was what I was into. Um, I was also into really adult animation. You remember Heavy Metal? Yes. Yeah. I remember it as a magazine. No, was was it was a magazine. magazine? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. My brothers used to read it. My, same. Yeah. My older brothers, as we've mentioned. Yeah. That's so all what, I remember. And so like, when the movie came out, come on, of course. I don't remember the movie. <gasps> Oh my god, it's the best worst movie. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my god, sexism in a pill. I would have liked it because I like the magazines because like all the women had big boobs. Oh, they're even bigger in the movie because they move. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's live action. It, no, no, no. It's, it's animated. Con- oh, just it's an even antho- more exaggerated. It's an anthology film. Okay. So it's a different director per uh, per animated segment. So okay. Like, I think like Ivan Reitman directed one. John Landis directed one. It was I big. Not? No, yeah. It was a big deal. Okay. But that's what I was into. I was into that. I was into Ralph Bakshi. Why was I into Ralph Bakshi? I had a fascination with New York, and Ralph Bakshi, he made these rated R animated films about New York. And frankly, I saw a lot of them again recently because I introduced my husband to them, and he's like, these would never get made today. These today, are, right. 
They're yeah, it's so like offensive. Crumb. It's like no. Well, I mean, the first movie he did was with R. Crumb there was Fritz the Cat. There you go. Okay. You know, the first X-rated animated movie ever right. made. Right. And we watched it recently. And can I just say, like, I, it, boy, um, yeah, it's really offensive. But it, there's a really funny way in which it skewers the way white people talk about black people. And I'm like, Ooh, wow, this yes. would really work today. Right. You're like, it's not all terrible. Yeah, it's not all they terrible. They were onto something. At the, some he points. was, and so was R. Crumb. Right. Uh, and but by the way, they're both geniuses. When you're, you're you're talking about being into this stuff, still as a kid, like a young you know why? teenager, you know why? Of your older brother. My parents, I think at that point they were so tired. Like, whatever could babysit me, they would let babysit me. Right. So, the arcade was yes. the babysitter, right? What arcades? Do you want to name drop? Uh, well, it doesn't exist anymore, and I, you know... Do the, any of them? To quote John Ginoli, <laughs> I hope, John, that you're listening to this, to quote, to quote John Ginoli from Pan Divi- Pansy Division, I wish I'd taken pictures. Yeah. Launchpad Arcade was my arcade. And where was that? That was at Saramonte Mall in Daly City. Okay. To me, Daly City was a magical place because the launch pad was there. Okay. And my dad would take me there. Oh, my parents would take me there. Um, and when you leave your kid alone, they're going to meet other kids. Yes. And I'll never forget being told about Hey Good Looking. It's a film that came out in 1982 by Ralph Bakshi. Okay. And, uh, and you can find it in the video store, he told me. Okay. And this was a guy who was playing, well, I don't know what the game was. It was one of those fighting games. It was probably like, like, like Ye Are Kung Fu or something. Yeah. But, um, or Ye Are Kung Fu. Right, but yeah. anyway, w- the other pastime was renting movies. Yes. Because we were proud of having a VHS player. We had totally. a VCR. Totally. And my mother and father just loved walking around Captain Video in Daly City yes. um, looking for a movie to watch that night. And they said, you find a movie too. Right. And for the first few years, I was really unoriginal because I'm like, Mary Poppins, again! <laughs> right? Right. Or The Wizard of Oz, again. <laughs> again! And then I got into anime, and then there was a voice ringing in the back of my head. I'm like, hmm, he said, hey, good looking. And I'll never forget him saying, like, but don't tell your parents. Okay. So in the middle of Captain Video, as was the case with for any video store back then, non there was a blockbuster, like, like non blo- blo- This is pre blockbuster. Mom and pop type. Yes. yes. At any video store, you had a huge book that was a big, just like database of yep. what the movies were. Um, I didn't know any better. I thought it's what they all had. Okay. But this is just a database of movies that existed. Right. right. Um, so I have looked. I I looked up Ralph Bakshi. Yeah. And lo and behold, they had his entire available collection. Oh shit. Oh. Behind beaded curtains or something? Like how did they? No. You just have to ask. This was the early '80s. Like they just had it all on display. Oh shit. Yeah. Okay. And I was like, I want this, Mom. She's like, oh, it's a cartoon. Okay. (laughs) And I'll never forget. Oh. Wow. Within, like, the first, like, I don't know how long, like, like, the characters are just, like, like, it's about race relations in 1950s New York. Oh, shit. Okay. Or, like, early 60s, I think. Early early 60s New York. Okay. So everyone looked like greasers. um, And it was literally about Italian gangs versus black gangs. So, like, the N-word was dropped, like, 30 times in the first 10 minutes and I'll never forget my mom saying like what are you watching? What is this cartoon? Yeah and I was like it's <laughs> educational. Right. Um, and yeah I remember from that point on I was like I'm going to watch all of these adult animated movies and I'm going to come back to my Catholic school and tell all the kids about it and I got in trouble. <laughs> oh yeah you did. Man because I was using language. Oh, I don't yeah, you know. Yeah. When you're that old you don't know what's politically correct. You Were know? the kids eating it up though? I became that weird kid that they wanted to avoid, but they couldn't because they also wanted to hear some stories. Exactly. Because he's into weird stuff. Right. He also opens things like he, he opens video games for so for no reason. Repellent and attractive. <laughs> More repellent. Um, but no, I because I, the other thing that was interesting, and I don't know why this was the case, but I actually stopped caring about my appearance so much. Where I was just like, well, I'll just let my hair grow to wherever it goes. I had really long hair. You know? Okay. And um, I was that kid that had, I was that kid that knew the underbelly. Apparently, <laughs> <laughs> you're like, I just went to Captain Video. That's all it was. Yeah. Mom but, had no idea. So the thing that's interesting, though, is I think if I hadn't skipped a grade, so I, yeah, I skipped second grade, I went to third grade, and I became that weird kid, that weird repellent kid, weird repugnant and repulsive kid who was into really creepy stuff that they wanted to know more about. Mm-hmm. I feel like if I hadn't skipped a grade, I would have been that cool kid that knew all the creepy exactly. stuff. Exactly. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but probably still getting in trouble. 
Uh, yeah, I know. Still we're still getting in trouble, but it would have been okay, and it might have been even cool. Yeah. I think at that point when I was getting in trouble, they're like, well, yeah, serves you right, youngster. That was H.P. Mendoza. On the next episode of Storied San Francisco, you'll hear the rest of H.P.'s life story. Part two drops Thursday. Music for the podcast was produced, performed, and curated by Otis McDonald. Original photography is by Michelle Kilfeather. Aaron Lim of Bitch Talk Podcast is our contributing producer. And the show is produced and hosted by me, Jeff Hunt. Now in our fourth season, we have more than 150 episodes available on our website, storiedsf.com, or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you can, subscribe, rate, and review our show so we can reach even more folks. And if you'd like to drop us an old-fashioned email, we'd love that. The address is storiedsf at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Stay safe. Stay strong, stay healthy, and we'll see you next time. This podcast is a proud member of the BFF.FM podcast network. Learn more at podcasts.bff.fm. BFF.FM, best frequencies forever.